Yes, hello there and welcome. Now I want us to look at a chemistry from three paper and let's begin from the first question. So the first question is asking, define the term isotope. So what are isotopes? So for the isotopes, we see that these are elements which have the same atomic number but different mass number. So those are what are called isotopes. So in exam, you should mostly take note not to mention isotopes as these are substances. You should never say these are substances. You should only say these are elements or these are atoms which have the same atomic number but different mass number. For example, you can see some of the isotopes we have. We have the chloride isotope and take note they have the same uh, atomic number but different mass number. So you can say they have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So those are isotopes. Also, we have the oxygen isotope. We have the ion isotope. So just take note that they must have the same atomic number but different mass numbers. Also, students tend, tend to confuse between isotopes and allotropes. So for the isotopes, remember, they have the same atomic number but different mass number. For the allotropes, remember, these are elements which, uh, which exist on the same state but different forms. So those are allotropes. So the elements or substances which have the same state but exist in different forms. Like for example, we have the carbon whereby we have different forms of carbon. We have diamond, we have graphite. So mind you, they are of the same state which is carbon but different forms which is diamond, graphite, we have the fullerene, we have the amorphous, we have the soot, etc. So that's the definition of the isotopes. So uh, question letter B is asking, the table below shows the isotopic composition of element Q. So the element Q is just an arbitrary element designated Q. So the table below shows the isotopic composition of element Q. So as you can see the table, we have the isotope, then we have Q having a mass number of 20, then 21, and then finally 22. And then the other side, we have the relative uh, abundance, whereby for one element, which is element Q21, we have not been given the abundance. So it is up to us to look for the abundance. And one thing you should know about the relative abundance is that the abundance is always over 100%. That is what you, sh you should and you must always know, unless the question states otherwise. But the abundance is always over 100%. So in this case, the abundance Q20, it's 90.92%. Uh, the abundance 21, we have not been given, which is X. And then the abundant 22 is 0.26%. So it is up to us to seek or to find out or to calculate what is the value of the abundance of the Q21. So the first question is asking, in 21Q, what does 21 represent? So we have been asked, the subscript 21. What does the subscript 21 represent? So you see that the subscript 21 always represents the mass number. So the super, uh, sorry, the, sub, the subscript represents the atomic number, but the superscript, which is now the, the topmost number always represents the mass number. So in this case, we are being asked, what does 21 represent? So here, what does 21 represent? So 21 always represents the mass number. So always know that the bottom number is always the atomic number. The topmost number is always the mass number. So in this case, 21 represents the mass number. So the next question, which is now Roman 2, is asking, determine the value of x. So have this in mind that the percentage abundance is always over a hundred percent. So if the percentage abundance is always over a hundred percent, then it will mean that if we add 90.92 plus 0 0.26 and then subtract by a hundred, we should get the value of x. So in this case, if we do that 90.92 uh, plus 0 0.26, minus 100%, so we are going to get 8.82%. So 100 minus 90.92 minus 0, plus 0 0.26, we are going to get 8.82%. Uh, so that is the value of our x. So at least now we have all the abundance for 20q, 
21q and 22q so the next question which is roman 3 it's asking calculate the relative atomic mass which is calculate the ram of q so first of all what is the definition of ram if you have been asked in an exam define the term ram so what is ram which is the relative atomic mass so you'll say that this is the this is the mass of any atom compared to one over 12 that one of carbon atom so that is the definition of relative atomic mass this is the mass of any element or any atom in the periodic table as compared to uh, as compared to one over 12 that of carbon atom or as compared to carbon negative 12 so that is the definition of relative atomic mass so in this case we have been asked calculate the relative atomic mass of q so for the calculation of relative atomic mass we only deal with the mass number and the percentage abundance only so in this case we are going to take the first one which is uh, 20 uh, that is for the q so you take 20 times 90.92 divided by 100 and then we add with all the other abundance so it is 20 times 90.92 divided by 100 for the first q and then plus the next one which is now the mass number 21 uh, 21 times 8.82 which was the abundance for the second one divided by 100 and then the last addition which is plus 22 which was the mass number for the last q times its abundance abundance which was 0.26 percent divided by 100 so if we add everything here we are going now to get the abundance for element q whereby the abundance should be 20.0934 so that is the abundance and that is how simple it is to calculate the relative abundance of any element so you just take the mass number multiplied by its abundance divided by 100 just what you have done here and then that first one you add with the second one and by the second one here was 21 times 8.82 divided by 100 which is in percentage divided by 100 plus the third one which is 22 times 0 0.26 divided by 100 and then you add everything to get now the total abundance for the element q so let's go now to the next question so the next question is asking about graham's uh, law of diffusion so for this graham's law of diffusion the first question is asking state graham's law of diffusion so what does graham law of diffusion state so this is the third law, uh, whereby the first law that we discussed, we discussed the Boyle's law, which states that volume is inversely proportional to pressure when the temperature is kept constant. And then as you can see, that was the formula for Boyle's law. And then after Boyle's law, we went to Charles' law and, and said that Charles' law, it states that volume is directly proportional to the temperature if the pressure is kept constant. And as you can see, that was the formula of the Charles' law. And after that, we now we also went to the third law, whereby now the fourth law is Gram law of diffusion, which states that uh, it states that the rate of diffusion of any given gas is inversely proportional to the square root of its density if the pressure and the temperature will be maintained constant. So that is the that is what Gram law of diffusion states. So it states that. The rate of diffusion of any given gas is inversely proportional to the square root of its own density if the pressure and the temperature is maintained constant. So part B was asking, so part B was asking 400 centimeters cubed of nitrogen gas. So take note, this is nitrogen gas, not nitrogen atom. So 400 centimeters cubed of nitrogen gas diffused through a plug, a porous plug, in 120 seconds. How long would it take 360 centimeters cubed of oxygen gas to diffuse under the same conditions? So 400 centimeters cubed diffuses uh, through a porous plug in 120 seconds. How long would it take 360 centimeters cubed of oxygen gas to diffuse under the same conditions? So here, first of all, what you must take note is that we have nitrogen gas having its own mass. We have oxygen gas having its own mass. So here we see that the mass of nitrogen is 28 grams, nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas means that we have two nitrogen, nitrogen atoms. 
So one nitrogen atom is 14 grams, the other nitrogen atom is 14 grams. So if you add these two, you are going to get the total mass of nitrogen gas is 28 grams. So for oxygen, on the other hand, it's a denser gas which is heavier than nitrogen. So one oxygen atom is 16 grams, the other one is 16 grams. Therefore, the mass of oxygen gas is 32 grams. So here, since we are being asked about the time, we are going to use the formula of time. So for the formula of time here, we're going to use, we're going to say the time of the first gas to diffuse divided by the time of the second gas to diffuse is equals to the square root of the, uh, the mass of the first gas to diffuse divided by the square root of the second gas to diffuse. So in this case, the first gas to diffuse is nitrogen. The second gas that we have been asked is oxygen. So substituting on the formula, we're going to say the time of nitrogen gas divided by the time of oxygen gas is equal to the square root of the molecular mass of nitrogen divided by the square root of molecular mass of oxygen. So in this case, we have been given that the time of nitrogen is 120 centimeters, which is 400 centimeters cubed. Yeah, it's 400 centimeters cubed. For oxygen, we have, been, we have not been given the time of oxygen, but we have been told that oxygen is 360 centimeters cubed. So if, if you have been brought in such a situation, the first thing and the most important thing you do is that bring nitrogen to the same level of oxygen. That is the, always the first thing to do. So the gas that you have not been given the time, like in this case, you have not been given the time of oxygen. So nitrogen, we have the time. So bring nitrogen to the level of the oxygen in terms of volume. Nitrogen is 400 centimeters cubed at 120 seconds. What if nitrogen was 360 seconds? So that is what you should ask yourself. If nitrogen was 360 seconds, how much time would it have diffused? So what we are going to do here, we are going to say that 460 centimeter, 400 centimeters cubed of nitrogen takes 120 seconds. What about 360 centimeters cubed of nitrogen gas, not oxygen? Let's bring nitrogen to the level of oxygen in terms of volume. So if 400 centimeters cubed of nitrogen takes 120 seconds, how about 360 centimeters cubed of nitrogen gas? So how long will 360 centimeters cubed of nitrogen gas take? So we're going to do that cross multiplication. And if you cross multiply it correctly, you're going to get 108 seconds. So 300, 360 centimeters cubed of nitrogen is going to take exactly 108 sen, uh, seconds to diffuse through that same, same porous plug. So now we have the time for nitrogen under the 360 centimeters cubed. So since we have now these values, so we are just going to continue now with the formula. So the formula, remember, it was the time of nitrogen gas divided by the time of oxygen is equal to the square root of the molecular mass of nitrogen gas divided by the square root of molecular mass of oxygen gas. Now let's substitute everything. So the time here for nitrogen under the same level of oxygen 360, so we are going to say 108 seconds divided by the time taken for oxygen it's equal to the square root of the molecular mass of nitrogen which is 28 divided by the square root of molecular mass of oxygen which is 32 grams so if you do all these calculations correctly you're going to get 115.976 so the time taken for oxygen therefore will be 115.976 seconds and that is correct so that is the time which oxygen will take to diffuse or rather that is the time whereby 360 centimeters cubed of oxygen is going to take to diffuse through the same porous plug the same as nitrogen so apart from that you can also use the formula for rate to calculate the time which nitrogen is going uh, which oxygen is going to diffuse through the same porous plug and to calculate the rate of uh, the rate of diffusion of a substance, we see that the rate is always equal to the volume divided by the time taken by a certain gas. So in this case, we have been given all the values of, uh, of nitrogen gas, whereby the values of nitrogen gas we have, the volume is 400 centimeters cubed and the time is 120 seconds. So we already have these values, whereby having these values, it can now be easy to calculate the rate by which 
nitrogen is diffusing. So if we divide 400 centimeters cubed divided by 120 seconds, so we're going to get nitrogen diffuses 3.3 seconds, 3.3 uh, centimeters cubed per second through that porous plug. So that is the rate uh, whereby nitrogen is diffusing through that porous plug. So we have 3.3 uh, centimeters cubed per second. So after that, we are going to employ now the formula for calculating the rate of diffusion according to Gram law of diffusion. Thereby, the first gas to diffuse, remember we have nitrogen. The second gas to diffuse, remember we have oxygen gas. So here, what we are going to do, we are going to use the formula of rate and say, the rate of nitrogen gas divided by, which is the first gas, the rate of nitrogen gas divided by the rate of oxygen gas is equal to the square root of the molecular mass of oxygen gas divided by the square root of molecular mass of nitrogen gas. So remember, the formula for calculating time is direct. Nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen. But now the formula for calculating the rate, this other side is inverse. Uh, like whereby we do this, the first gas over the second gas is equal to the square root of the molecular mass of the first gas, of the second gas rather, divided by the square root of the molecular mass of the second gas as per the definition of the rate of diffusion of Graham law of diffusion. So here we have the rate of nitrogen gas divided by the rate of oxygen gas is equal to the square root of the molecular mass of oxygen gas divided by the square root of molecular mass of nitrogen gas. So here we have already found that the rate of nitrogen gas is equal, yeah, the rate of nitrogen gas is equal to 3.3 centimeters cubed per second. Oxygen gas, we have not been given the rate. So the second step or the next step that you're going to do since we have the rate, so we are going to do this, we are going to substitute everything in, the, in our equation and say that 3.3 centimeters cubed per second for nitrogen over the rate of oxygen gas is equal to the square root of oxygen gas mass, which is the square root of 32 grams divided by the square root of 28 grams. So if you do this calculation correctly, you're going to get that the rate of oxygen gas, uh, the rate of oxygen gas is equal to 3.087 centimeters cubed per second. So that is the rate of oxygen gas that you have calculated here. So that is the rate, remember that. And also remember, how do we find the rate? So uh, like as we are beginning, we say that the formula for calculating the rate is equals to, so the rate is equals to the volume divided by the time. So that is the formula for calculating the rate. So in this case, we already have the rate of oxygen gas, whereby the rate is 3.087 centimeters cubed per second. So let's substitute everything to the formula for calculating the rate and say that 3.087 centimeters cubed per second is equals to 360 divided by x. So the x is represented by the time whereby we should calculate this time for oxygen to diffuse. So this time, if we do everything correctly, we should get that the rate is 116.247. So 116.247 is now the time whereby oxygen will diffuse through that porous plug. So let's look at the first equation. So the, the first method that, that we did using the time, we got 115.9. So this other one, we are getting 116.2. So if we round everything off, both of the times you are going to get, both of the times is 115, uh, 116, whereby we are still correct. So if you use this formula or the formula for it, you are still going to get everything correctly. So you should take note because sometimes the question may ask, use the formula of rate to calculate the time. Or the question sometimes may ask, use the formula of, uh, the formula of time to calculate the time for that gas. So you should know and you should be in a best position to use both formulas to calculate the time if we have been asked to use this formula or that other formula to calculate what you have been asked. So the next question is asking, Acid rain is formed when rain falls through air polluted with carbon 4 oxide and sulfur 4 oxide. So those are the conditions whereby we get acid rain. If rain falls on uh, air which is polluted with sulfur 4 oxide or carbon 4 oxide. Identify two acids possibly present in acid rain. 
So identify the acids present in acid rain. So here, in short, what this question is asking, th this question is asking what happens when carbon dioxide reacts with water? Because rain is water. What happens when carbon dioxide reacts with water? What happens when sulfur dioxide reacts with water? Which now brings up the acid rain. So the two acids present. So identify the two possible, uh, possible acids present in acid rain. So the first one which is brought from, as a result of carbon dioxide, we have carbonic acid, whereby the carbonic acid is H2CO3. So if carbon dioxide reacts with water in form of rain, so we are going to get carbonic acid. So that is the first acid. So the next acid whereby we get from acid rain from sulfur dioxide, we get sulfurous acid. So sulfurous acid is an unstable acid, whereby the sulfurous acid is going to react with the atmospheric oxygen to form sulfuric acid. So in this case, if you give your answer as carbonic acid from carbon dioxide, you get it correctly. If you give sulfurous acid, you get it correct. If you give sulfuric acid, you will also get it correctly because sulfurous acid being a weak, uh, an unstable acid reacts with the atmospheric oxygen, to form sulfuric acid so that you could get it uh, that is correct so the next question is asking the empirical formula of a compound is given us c2h4o that is uh, that is ethanol so that is referred to as the ethanol so the empirical formula of a compound is given as c2h4o which is oxygen given that the relative molecular mass is 88 find the molecular formula so this question is asking about the molecular formula. So you should take note. We have already been given the empirical formula. So we are not going to go through all that calculation of empirical formula because we have already been given the empirical formula. So the question is asking, the question is asking what is the molecular formula? How do we determine the molecular formula? So we calculate the mass of the empirical formula and then we divide with the, uh, with the mass of the molecular formula now to find the each constituent elements of the molecular formula that you have been asked so in this case the ethanol uh, which is the empirical formula we have c2h4o we must first of all calculate the mass of this empirical formula and upon calculating the mass of the empirical formula we divide with the mass of the molecular formula to find out the constituent elements present in the molecular formula. So this is what you are going to do. Let's first of all calculate the mass of the empirical formula. So we know that the mass of carbon is 12. The mass of hydrogen is 1. The mass of oxygen is 16. So in this case, we have two carbon atoms. And then we have four hydrogen atoms. And then after that, we have one oxygen atom. So if we add the mass of all these elements so we are going to get a mass of 44 grams whereby the carbon uh, the carbon uh, we have two carbon atoms whereby that is 28 so 28 if we add 16 and then 16 we add plus uh, we add uh, plus the mass of hydrogen so we're going to get that the mass is 44 grams so as you can see what we have done we have the 44 grams is in the brackets and then that n represents now the number of individual atoms so here in this case we'll say that 44 bracket n is equals to now the mass of the molecular formula so 44 n is equals to 88 so the value of n is now going to tell us now the individual number of atoms for the molecular formula so if you cross multiply 44 uh, and 88 so we are going to get that the value of n is equals to 2 so that is the value of n so having known the value of n, which is 2, so we are going to say that this empirical formula, exactly what we have done here, this empirical formula, which is C2H4O, we are going to multiply everything by 2, the 2 that we have, we have gotten. So we are going to multiply everything by that 2. If we do that, we are going to get the molecular formula. So that's how we get the molecular formula. So remember how we began. The first thing we do, we take the empirical formula, we put it in bracket and then the value of n. Whereby, to get the value of n, we are going to, to calculate the mass of the empirical formula and then we divide with the mass of the molecular formula. 
So the mass of the empirical formula, remember, we got it as 44. So we're going to say 44N is equals to the mass of the molecular, which is 88. So doing this, we are going to get the value of N is equals to 2, and then 2 multiplies everything inside. So if 2 multiplies everything, therefore we are going to get C, C4, we are going to get H8, and then O2. So this compound is called ethyl acetate. So ethyl acetate is the molecular, uh, is, the, is now the molecular formula that we are being asked. So the correct answer here is C4H8O2. So that is what the question was asking. So the question was asking, find the molecular formula. So that is the molecular formula. So the molecular formula is C4H8O2. So it's as simple as that. If you have been given the molecular formula, you have the empirical formula, just follow that method and you're going to get now the molecular formula itself. So question number five is asking, what name is given to each of the following? Ability of a metal to be beaten and hammered into sheets. So for example, if you take a metal, we beat that metal and make it into very long sheets. Uh, like maybe for example, like this tab. Let's assume this was just a very thin metal. So we hit this metal and it became very long, thin sheets. So what is the name given to that phenomenon? So that phenomenon is called malleability or is called malleable. So uh, like whereby we have aluminium is malleable. So this malleable means that it is possible for us to heat aluminium and make it to a very long sheet of aluminium metal, something very flat, like a chapati. <laughs> Ikoivo flat kabisa. So since Ikoivo flat, the phenomenon whereby you heat a metal to make it that flat, Iyo inaitua, it's called malleability or we can say that the metal is malleable. So these things go hand in hand with the ductile. So we have malleable and ductile. So malleable, remember we say that we heat that metal to form very long sheets of the metal. So that is malleable. Ductile means that the ability of a metal to be drawn into very thin wires. Like for example, we have magnesium. So magnesium is ductile meaning that it has the ability to be able to be shaped or to be drawn into very long wires. So that is malleable and ductile. So these two things go hand in hand. So the next question, which is B, is asking, what is the name given to each of the following? The force of, forces of attraction that hold two molecules together. Like, for example, mostly for the gases. For the gases, we see that we write O2, we write F2, we write Cl2, we write S2. Uh, what is the name given to these forces which hold these molecules together? Because we see, for example, for oxygen, which is O2, it means that we have one oxygen bonded to another oxygen. So this force which holds e oxygen moja ni oxygen ingine pamoja, that force of attraction is called what? So that force of attraction is called intermolecular force. So intermolecular force is the force which makes up the bond. And then we see the bond is it's now the name uh, like which is given to when one atom or no, when one element is joined to another element. So that force is called the intermolecular force. So that force which hold one molecule together with another molecule or one atom with another atom is referred to as the intermolecular forces. So if you can remember the previous class, we also studied about kinetic theory of matter, whereby you say that kinetic theory of matter simply states that matter is made up of tiny particles that are in constant random motion. So this force which holds these particles of matter together that force is also referred to as intermolecular force, whereby in that class we say that if, if matter is subjected to heat, heat breaks this intermolecular force. If this intermolecular force is broken, these particles will move apart. So if it's the solid particles, so the solid particles will move apart forming the liquid. If it's the liquid particles, these particles will move apart forming the gas. So those we discussed in the previous class, but the most important thing for you to know right now is that these forces holding the molecules together or the atoms together, they are referred to as the intermolecular forces of attraction. So the next question is asking, uh, draw the structure and name two hydrocarbons with the molecular formula of C4H10. So draw the structure and name two hydrocarbons with the molecular formula of C4H10. 
First of all, let's identify this hydrocarbon. First of all, let's define what is a hydrocarbon. So what is a hydrocarbon? So a hydrocarbon is any compound which has carbon and hydrogen in its structure. So any compound which has carbon and hydrogen in its structure is referred to as a hydrocarbon. Now in this question, we're being asked about this hydrocarbon, which is C4H10. So which is this hydrocarbon? So this hydrocarbon is referred to as butane. Why is it called butane? It is called a butane because it has four carbon atoms. So since it has four carbon atoms, that is a butane. If you draw the structure of butane, as you can see, we see that it has single bond. There is nowhere in the structure whereby there is a triple bond or a double bond. So every carbon atom is joined to another carbon atom with a single bond. So since each carbon is joined to another carbon with a single bond, so it becomes an alkene. It's in the family of alkene. Why is it in the family of alkene? Because each carbon atom is joined to another carbon atom with a single bond. That's why the name of this structure ends with the A-N-E, meaning that it is from the family of alkenes. So this is a butane. So the question was asking, draw the structure of butane. That's the structure of butane, as you can see. And then draw two hydrocarbons with the molecular formula of C4H10. So this question is asking us to draw two other hydrocarbons which have the same molecular formula but should now have different structural formula. So what is the name given to those structures which have the same molecular formula but different structural formula? So those structures are referred to as isomers. So those are isomers. Now what this question is asking, this question is asking about isomers. We draw the isomer of butane. Whereby, remember, an isomer, these are structures which have the same molecular formula. If you can be able to count these carbons and hydrogen, we have four carbons, we have ten hydrogens. So it should have the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. This structure, how it looks like, we just alter this structure, but then again, we make sure that the molecular formula is same. We have four carbons, we have ten hydrogens. So for example, so the next isomer we have, 2-methylpropane, as you can see, 2-methylpropane. So the longest carbon chain is a prop, a prop which is propane. So propane means three carbon atoms. So if it is three carbon atoms, it's a propane. Remember, one carbon atom is methane, methane gas like the one that you use at home for cooking. Ile gas ya kawaida yo gas ya nyumbani, yo gas inakongandani is called methane gas. So one carbon atom is methane gas. Two carbon atom is ethane gas. Three carbon atom is propane gas. Four carbon atom is now butane gas. Now, one isomer of butane, we have that two methyl propane. So the longest carbon chain is three carbon atoms. It's a prop. And then the branch is appearing exactly at the second carbon atom. Now, since it appears at the second carbon atom, the first information we must give is the position of the branch. So the branch is appearing at carbon number two. So that's why the name is two, and then the branch is a methyl. So it is, it's supposed to be CH3. So since we have removed one hydrogen, it now ceases to be methane. We have removed one hydrogen, so it becomes methyl. So that's why we are saying it is two, appearing carbon number two, and then the branch name is methyl, and then the longest carbon chain is a propane so that's why the name is 2 methyl propane so remember the first information you give the position of the double bond it's appearing at uh, not the position of the double bond the position of the branch so it is appearing at carbon number two so you give the first value two and then that branch name the branch name is a methyl so you say two methyl and then the longest carbon chain is the last information whereby the longest carbon chain is propane so that's why the name is two methyl propane and that's the other branch so butane has only two isomers only two isomers and those are the two isomers for butane so the second question is uh, uh, the next question rather is asking 800 centimeters cubed of a gas exert a pressure of 520 millimeters of mercury at 75 degrees celsius what pressure will the 700 centimeters cubed 
of the same gas exert at 100 degrees Celsius. Now, in this case, the most important thing and the first thing that you should check anytime you have been asked about the gas law, do this. What have you been asked? Have you been asked about pressure, temperature, and volume? If you have been asked about those three things, automatically you are going to use the combined gas law. If you have only been asked about the volume and the temperature, you should only use Charles law. If you have been asked about the volume and the pressure, you should only use Boyle's law. In this case, this question is asking about the first information we have there, 800 centimeters cube, that is volume. Then the next thing we have been asked, 520 millimeters of mercury, that is pressure. Then the next information, 75 degrees Celsius, that is temperature. So the next bit of information we have been asked, what would, up, uh, what would press, what pressure would 700 centimeters cube, that is volume, of the same gas exact at 100 degrees Celsius, that is temperature. So in this case, you have been asked everything. We have volume, pressure, and temperature. So what formula are we going to use? Combined gas law. Because combined gas law calculates both uh, for volume and temperature and also the pressure. So here the, formula, the best formula to use is P1V1 over T1 is equals to P2V2 over T2. If you can be able to look at this, this equation, you'll notice that we have Boyle's law, whereby it is P1V1 is equals to P2V2. That is Boyle's law. And also we have Charles' law, which is V1 over T1 is equals to V2 over T2. Now, since these two equations were brought together, that's when the name was called combined gas law because it combines Boyle's law and the Charles' law. As simple as that, simple chemistry. So, proceeding along, we see that we have 800 centimeters cubed of a gas and then we have 520 millimeters of mercury at 75 degrees Celsius. Please try to, to arrange them in this way. It is easy for you to calculate if you have some order in your calculation. And then the next bit of information we have V2, which is 700, degree, 700 centimeters cubed. P2 we don't have. And then we have T2 as 100 degrees Celsius. So in gas law, the most important thing again that you should know is that always convert all temperature in degrees Celsius to Kelvin. All temperatures must be converted to Kelvin. That is a must. So never use degree Celsius in calculating the gas law. Always use, uh, always use Kelvin. So all degree Celsius must be converted to Kelvin. So in this case, if you do your calculations correctly after substitution, you should get your answer as 635.27 millimeters of mercury as P2. So that's what you should get, 635.27 millimeters of mercury as pressure 2. So the most important thing here is that you should know, uh, that you should know is that, take note, have you been given pressure, volume, temperature? Use combined gas law. Have you been given volume and temperature? Use Charles law. Have you been given pressure and volume? Use Boyle's law. So take note to know exactly what the question is asking for you to use the correct formula to calculate.